Okay, let's get going with lecture. And uh, just, uh, we, we just finished handing back exam printouts. And we'll try to do that um, as soon as I get them back after each midterm. And I want to give you a little bit of guidance about those. All right, first of all, your total score for exam X is the sum of what you have for um, points, raw points on your printout, plus whatever you have from clicking. All right. So the, the add, add those two together. They and if you get all of them, I mean, it'll add up to 50. Uh, but that's how it works. Now, on the printout that you have, uh, the percentage is don't even just cross it out because that's a percentage of the clicking questions. But the the Scantron machine that graded that and generated the printouts knows nothing of my grade scheme. It doesn't know any, it doesn't know anything about clicking. It only knows it only knows about um, scantrons. All right. So do you have a question? Okay, uh, so that percentage is, it's, it's nice, that's the percentage from the Scantron, but it doesn't include the clicking, and, but we include the clicking, all right? Now, the other thing I want you to uh, bear in mind is I'll be publishing here in the next week or so a little blurb sheet for each of you um, or for each exam uh, form that gives you a little gist of each question. Uh, except for the matching. If you're talking when I'm talking, you're, I can hear you, and everybody around you can hear me, can hear you. All right? So you don't want to do that. Uh, this printout plus the blurb sheet that you're going to get in the next week will help you study for the final because you'll know all the questions that you answered wrong on your test and you'll have a little blurb about each question on the test and therefore about each one that you got wrong on the test. So uh, that'll help you study for the final because the final is cumulative. When we get to December, you're going to need to know everything. Another thing I want you to do visually right now with your printout, and if you didn't get your printout, uh, if you were too slow to get up here, it's all right. We'll get you at the end of class. Hopefully we'll dismiss a little early today. Uh, but if you do have your printout, check to see if you have any double answers. Also check it to see if you have any blanks. Now what we can do, if you have the, raise your hand if you have a double answer where you answered two. Anybody? One person in the back. Uh, anybody else? Okay, raise your hand if you had a blank. Uh, okay, now you guys, what I want you to do is br bring those right now to, to Miss Trisha up here. Trisha, can you grab these? Just come on down. And what we'll do is we'll dig out your Scantron and see if it really was a blank. Now, that's going to take a couple days, but that's what we'll do. So if you have a blank or a double answer, because double answers are going to be marked wrong. But what we'll do is we'll look at your Scantron and we'll see which one you erased and which one you, you know. The same with the blanks. And the blanks, uh, a student last name Sosa, where are you? Sosa. You're somewhere in here. Uh, one of the students didn't mark in there, yeah, uh, the test form, you know, so that was bl probably blank. That's what I'm guessing happened. Could, oh. What's your name again? 
Did I message you today about that? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, that's our very next topic. All right, you got them all? <laughs> yeah. Okay, put that in, uh, put that, uh, fold those in half and put them on top of everything. All right, so many of you have been trying to figure out, you know, how come I can't look at my grade uh, in the little gray box down at the bottom of the grades page? It says it's been disabled. And because in other classes, the instructors do that. Now, that may be true, but I, ha I have disabled it. And the reason is that uh, web courses does not, and we can't program in web courses. I can't program in our grading scheme. You know, so we mix in, you know, best two out of three, and then uh, homework, and then participation. There's no way to program that into web courses. And so therefore, it, anything that web courses says about your grade is going to be inaccurate. So I just always tell people, um, just go by what you, this, go by the points that you have on the books. I mean, because the like your exam scores, those are all kosher, okay. And you can look at your homework scores, okay. We only have two; it's pretty, pretty modest right now. Uh, the only thing you can't estimate right now is your clicking pointage, which will be forty-five based on forty-five points. Uh, but I think I'll try to do a roundup of your clicking. Uh, this week, so you may be able to estimate that. But there's no way for web courses to do all that. Web courses is not smart enough, and instead, it's web, it's Canvas's way or the highway with a lot of things in web courses. And so I just say, forget about it, Canvas. I don't want anything that you have to say, and that is why that stuff is turned off. Okay. So um, I know. Some instructors have a different grading scheme, and but it is you know we can't, we can't. There's a lot of things in Canvas that I don't like, and I, that one I can turn off. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. So, any other questions about that kind of stuff, grades and stuff? Do you have a question? Okay, okay. Um, all right. Uh, let me make uh, one more thing, a uh, comment about grades. The um, Scantron score that you have, it's right now it's muted in web courses. I'll unmute that this afternoon. All right, I'd like to give back the printouts that you guys got today before I unmute those grades. They've been in there since late Friday, so I've been looking at them and stuff. By the way, um, average grade was 70, of people that did both Scandron and clicking, uh, average grade was 76. So I like to get it around, somewhere around 70. So 76, that's like a B minus on our grade scale. That's, I mean, if I were to give a letter grade to it, so that's not too bad. Uh, the next one might be a little bit lower. You know, but somewhere around 70% is where I like to, to write the exam. Now, uh, one more thing. This is the halfway point. After today, we're, we have completed the first half, uh, lecture 14 out of 28 lectures. Now, unfortunately, three of those we lost. So that's a week and a half, over a week and a half. Uh, so we're a little bit behind where we want to be but we're gonna keep going, all right? So this is the halfway point for this course, and it's that should be the halfway point for most of your courses, unless you have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday course, maybe Wednesday, tomorrow will be the halfway point for that, all right? So any final questions about grades and, and whatnot before we dip into the planets? Okay, let's keep going. All right, more comments from chapter seven. We did talk about chapter seven. We looked at the basic 
uh, mass ratio between Jupiter and the sun. It was 998 to one. Um, let's talk about the other planets. For the, and, and this is a quote from chapter seven. Besides Earth, five other planets were known to the ancients, i.e. to the Babylonians and the ancient Greeks and those guys. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Two were in, discovered in the last hundred something years after the invention of the telescope, Uranus and Neptune. And that's kind of interesting. What they did was they found some small perturbations, uh, a little blip in the orbit uh, of uh, Saturn, I believe. And from that, they deduced that there had to be a planet. And that in a, a particular location, they went looking for it and they found it. They found both of them that way. They didn't know that they were out there, but they figured that they were out there. They couldn't see them. But then when they pointed a telescope in just the right direction, they bagged it. So Neptune and Uranus uh, are not naked eye, but the other ones are. Uh, and tomorrow night, can somebody look up the night side of the stars? See if they're, what color it is. There's a chance we might get out there tomorrow night. And if we do, you're going to be looking at Saturn for sure. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about Saturn's appearance today. Uh, by the way, this is a cool diagram. I really like it. It shows the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter, compared to this, this little teeny blip down here at the bottom. That's Earth. Now, this is a diagram from your textbook. And uh, I really like it a lot. It shows you how gigantic those planets, and those planets are shrimpy compared to the sun. And the earth is really shrimpy compared to the sun. Earth is shrimpy compared to Jupiter and Jupiter is shrimpy compared to the sun. It's a thousand times less mass. Okay, any, any, what's the color on them? Okay, so tomorrow night is purple. Hopefully tomorrow night will go green because it was really clear this morning. So if it's clear tomorrow night around nine o'clock, ding, bonus points time. What's that? All right. So hopefully we'll get in some ob observing. And by the way, you guys, every time that you go, go as many times as you can, as many times as you can fit it in your schedule. And every time you go, you'll get some bonus points. And I have to look up how many I traditionally give. I think it's either five or ten. But uh, don't quote me on that. I'll look it up in the historical archives. Um, now, here's a, a, a little bit of terminology. The inner four planets are known as the terrestrial planets, so Mercury through Mars. We're going to talk about them today. So that's a vocabulary term, terrestrial or inner planets. And those four planets are definitely different than the outer uh, four planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. Definitely different. Um, the next four planets, here's some more comments. Ooh, this is still number one. It, it should be, I think, number three. Anyway, the next four planets, Jupiter through Neptune, are much larger and are co composed primarily of lighter ices, liquids, and gases. They're more like vast spherical oceans with very small, dense cores. Um, so... The Earth is rocky and metallic. Our planet has a metallic core. We think it's pretty much iron and uh, nickel for the core of the, the very core of the Earth. And then its cladding is um, silicate, silicon dioxide, silicons and oxygens and a bunch of uh, other chemicals in there that form rocks and, and magma. Uh, now, we think that the core of Jupiter and Saturn are like that same composition, except they're very tiny. So it's like a little seed, but all around that is basically hydrogen and helium and a mixture of other stuff. Now, a vocabulary term in here is ice, ice. Now, for us civilians, when we see the word ice, we think water ice, but for an astronomer, uh, the word ice means water ice, H2O. Go ahead and make a note of it. 
CO2 ice, dry ice, we see a lot of that in comets. Uh, ammonia ice, NH3. Um, methane ice, we see a lot of that. That's, uh, methane is CH4. And several other simple, simple compounds um, that are gaseous here on Earth, uh, like water, you know, water's gaseous in the atmosphere, water vapor. Uh, ammonia is um, gaseous when you smell it. Uh, methane is part of natural gas. Uh, and, uh, but in certain conditions and temperatures of pressure and temperature, it can form ice, and in the outer planets, it does that quite a bit. The sun has basically the same composition as Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and this is actually a homework question. Uh, they seem to have formed from the same reservoir of material. So for us, uh, James, that would be... Um, the solar ne or the pre-solar nebula, all the swirl of gas and dust and ice, smithereens from blown apart stars that formed many billions of years before our solar system blew up and swirled around out in the galaxy and eventually uh, a swirl dense, got denser and denser and started spinning and, and became a sun, one star, and a bunch of little planets. Uh, so that would be the reservoir of material. And here's the final com com uh, comment. Nearly all the oxygen present is combined chemically with hydrogen to form water. Uh, and that is significant, H2O. And it, it's also going to be significant for us when we uh, look at exoplanets and also when we look at meteorites, comets, and... Uh, Good. I thought she was coming up here to ask me something. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, as we, we talked about the uh, isotopes of oxygen last time, the isotopes of hydrogen, and that's going to be important when we talk about exoplanets, also when we talk about uh, meteorites, comets, and asteroids. But before we do that, let's talk about the terrestrial planets. And this is a lovely image of Mars. Mars is a planet that we've studied. You know, I think we've studied Mars a lot more than we've studied the moon. The only difference is we've actually put men on the moon. And men are the best exploring systems. You know, the rovers are nice, but humans are infinitely more capable. Uh, because humans can, you know, make... But, you know, the rovers up there on Mars and stuff, they're run by humans back on Earth, so it's, it's still pretty good. But, um, you know, we've, got, we've, we've studied Mars a ton. Uh, and the basic reason, you know why we, we study Mars? It's a lot like Earth, as we'll see. We're going to go through some of the specs for Mars in a minute. Uh, and we're, a lot of people are like daydreaming, you know, centuries ahead, maybe colonizing Mars. You know, that would be your grandchildren will grow old and have their own grandchildren. And the, the grandchildren of those maybe will be colonizing Mars. It's way up there. We might send men there to make a base, but to actually colonize and make cities, that's far in the future. Okay, the dividing line between the inner planets and the outer planets is something that astronomers call the frost line. Now that's the place in the solar system where inside of that frost line, the solar system is so hot that water will not freeze. Methane will not freeze. CO2 will not freeze. So there's not much ice. There is a lot of rock and metal inside the frost line. And that's why the terrestrial planets um, are rocky and metallic. Planets outside of that 
tend to be um, colder and have a lot more icy structures and retain a lot of uh, gaseous material. Uh, even if in the, co in the core, for instance, in the core of Jupiter, we think there's actually, um, Adrian, we think there's actually some metallic hydrogen in the core of Jupiter. But I mean, you know, Jupiter is mainly hydrogen and helium and a, lot, and a little bit of these other gases. But uh, all that stuff can condense and freeze and then form a planet outside the frost line. Now, it's kind of interesting. The asteroids are inside the frost line. Jupiter is outside the frost. So it's somewhere between Mars, roughly. I mean, it's, it's not like there's, you know, like there's a big dotted line in the solar system. And if you turn your telescope to directly in that direction, you'll see it. But it's kind of like a mathematical line. Um, somewhere between the orbit of Mars, which is 1.52 astronomical units, and the orbit of Jupiter, 5.2 astronomical units. And inside that frost line, you won't see a whole lot of CO2, H2O, methane. I mean, we think that, you know, the oceans of Earth are really deep. You know, there's a ton of water in them. And we love that, you know, you know, you know sharks and whales and stuff diving down into the briny deep. But if you, if you look at the Earth as a whole, on the scale of the Earth, the, the oceans of Earth are like a little puddle. They are, they are zip zap compared to the size of, of our planet. If we had really deep oceans, well, places like Jupiter and Saturn, those are actually like really, really deep oceans. But Earth is, uh, you know, it's, it's deep to us, but it's, it's not to, you know, solar system wise, it's not that deep. Uh, so the frost line. So that's the, the, uh, the div dividing line between rocky metallic inner planets and the big outer planets, the big gas planets. Okay, let's take a look at some basic specs for Mars. Uh, distance, as I mentioned, is 1.524 astronomical units. It's colder because it's further from the sun. And it's got a longer year. Now, the spin rate for Mars is about the same as Earth. It's just a little bit longer day. Now, there's no significance to that. It just happened to be the, the way that Mars formed in the early solar system. It took a spin that now is uh, slowed down to 24 and uh, 6, 6, 5, 0.97% of, of an hour per day. Now, its axis tilt is 1.85 degrees away from the North Star. So it's, so when you say north on Mars, it's, it's nearly the same as saying north on Earth, okay? You know, to go to the, to the north on Earth, you follow the, the North Star, Polaris. Now, uh, Mars is tilted just a little bit away. So there's no, po you know, Polaris would be orbiting or forming a circle. If you were up at the North Pole of, which is in this picture here, at the top of the picture, that's the North Pole of Mars. If you were up there standing on all that water and CO2 ice, yep, that's CO2, a lot of CO2 ice up there in the polar ice caps. Uh, of Mars, if you were standing up there and you were looking straight up, you'd see the North Star making a very small circle in the sky. I mean, if you looked at it for 24.6597 hours, you'd see the, the North Star make a very small circle. Whereas here on Earth, if you went to the very North Pole on Earth um, and looked straight up, the, the North Star would just kind of sit there. And everything else would form circles around the North Star. Right, so it's, it's, it's fairly close to Earth's uh, spin orientation and spin rate. The orbit, as we know, and as Kepler grappled with, it's fairly eccentric. So it's significantly closer to the sun during its southern hemisphere summer. Right? Now this picture here is uh, northern hemisphere 
uh, summer. It's tilted towards the sun. All right. Uh, and the reason you can see, you know that, is that you can see more of the northern ice cap than you can see the southern, and all of it's lit up. So you're looking at Mars a uh, full phase. You're looking at the entire day side of Mars, and you see most of the northern ice cap. So that means it's summer in the northern hemisphere, winter in the uh, southern hemisphere. But when it is summer in the southern hemisphere, uh, you're significantly closer. And for that reason, you have more extreme seasons in the southern hemisphere. And here's an example of extreme seasons um, in southern, especially um, near the equinox. Here's two pictures from 2001. June 26th, everything looks copacetic. All right, you can see a little bit of each uh, ice cap. But then look, September 4th, 2001, look at the size of that dust storm. That is the entire planet. Mars is smaller than us, all right? But we don't have anything like this on Earth. Our dust storms uh, are very small compared to our planet, but not on Mars. And we think that that's because of its eccentric orbit, that it has these drastic changes. All that, and matter of fact, you know what? When, when you look at satellite images of the North Atlantic during, you know, like any time of the year, but everybody looks at it during the summer and the autumn because of hurricanes. When you look at that, every once in a while, you'll see a sandstorm from Sahara floating across the Atlantic. And if you've ever lived in the Caribbean, you know that Sometimes there are days when you, you're getting dust from the Sahara Desert. You can see it on the satellites. Did you ever notice that? Yeah. You can, I, I noticed it when I lived in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and people will tell you, yeah, we're, we got dust today from, from Africa. And, if, and it actually, in the, in the past, the amount of dust that has accumulated, they can, they can see it in, in geological formations, rock formations. This dust all the way from, from the Sahara Desert. And we see dust storms in, uh, in the far north uh, floating across the Pacific from China every once in a while. And we can see uh, f uh, smoke from uh, gigantic forest fires in Siberia and northern China. You see those drifting across the Pacific towards us. It's really cool. But they're much smaller than this. So Mars is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, distance about 7.5 or 757 light seconds. In other words, one and a half, about one and a half times ours. 1.52 AUs, 757 light seconds uh, from our star. More basic specs. Here's this famous picture of Curiosity. Now. If you walk around the equator of Mars, it's about 13,000 miles, all right? Now that's a little bit more than halfway around the Earth. Earth is about 24,000 miles. If you're, you know, if you could walk, you know, most of the equator is, is ocean, but uh, if you could walk or fly, I guess, it'd be about 24,000 miles. But for, uh, for Mars, it's about 13,000. So it's, it's definitely smaller. Here's a crucial factor. The, see, see, the thing that... Um, I'll, I'll tell you something that... It's not like a secret, but they don't publicize it a lot. But almost every NASA spacecraft, no matter what it's doing... It's always looking for water. You know, the, 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 the Apollo astronauts, they brought rocks back from the moon. Oh, they wanted to know if there was water up there. And they were hoping to find vestiges of, of it. 
in the rocks, the moon rocks, we have found water on the moon. You know where we found it? We found big ice deposits in near the, the north and the south pole of the moon in deep craters that never get sunlight. And here's what happens. Um, you know, the moon has taken a lot of direct hits. All those craters are from like asteroids and comets, small comets and stuff like that. And any kind of a comet is going to bring in a lot of H2O. And that H2O is going to be blown to smithereens. Now, most of it's going to drift away, but some of it is going to, you know, be attracted down. And if it's cold enough, it'll freeze. And if it freezes inside of a crater that never gets any sunlight, it stays there. And we found it, you know, a number of years ago, we found that stuff. On Mars, they're all about finding water. We got every single spacecraft uh, fitted with something that can find water in some way. The rovers that are up there, um, they, they want, they, they're looking for water. And they're looking for other stuff too. I mean, they're, they're trying to examine all the rocks and stuff. Uh, but a huge amount of uh, brain power is devoted to finding water. The orbiters, we've got a bunch of orbiters, you know, circling around on Mars, you know, mapping it out, taking photos, you know, trying to find the little green men. We still haven't found any of those guys. But uh, we've definitely found Buku water. Uh, we have a ground penetrating radar on the Mars Express. All right, and the ground penetrating water, uh, or the ground penetrating radar has found water. It's kind of an interesting uh, system. Ground, go ahead and make a note on ground penetrating water. We first put a ground penetrating radar onto a spacecraft back in the 60s. And the reason that we did that was because we wanted to be able to have a spacecraft that could look, uh, use radar to look underground in Russia to see what the Ruskies were doing with missiles. Now, we didn't want to tell the Russians that we were looking into their missile silos from space. So what they did, they, you know, these the satellites, you know, when they're not looking at Russia, they're looking at everything else. You know, so when they're passing over uh, Africa, they're looking down, they're looking subsurface, pen, you know, subsurface radar in, in Africa. You know, when they're passing over Australia, same thing. South America, same thing. North America, same thing. So here's what they found. When they, they, they had a bunch of scientists and they published an article in National Geographic, the scientists, when it passed over Egypt, they found a, a lot of old structures under the sands of the Nile Delta that no one had ever seen before, but they were down there. And so they wanted to let the Russians know, yeah, we can see everything you got. So don't try any tricks. You know, they're trying to nuclear, uh, they were trying to negotiate these nuclear uh, treaties and stuff. And so the whole thing is, can we trust the Russians when they say that they're gonna demobilize 10 missiles in some town in Siberia? Well, we had to let them know that, yeah, we can see what you're doing in Siberia. So they published this article in National Geographic about these underwater or these underground channels deep under the surface of the sands of the Sahara. And the Russians got the message. And they made a lot of good treaties uh, based on that. That's when they developed that technology. Now, they put it on the Mars Express. We got it all over the place now. And a matter of fact, uh, civilians have ground penetrating radar. And the cops use ground penetrating radar to find uh, things buried under the ground sometimes. Things buried in concrete. You know, like Jimmy Hoffa and all that stuff. Uh, okay, carbon dioxide. Now, most of the, there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of Mars. There's not much oxygen anymore. There used to be some oxygen. And that's the other thing, you know, that's the other pipe dream about exploring Mars. You know, this famous movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, 
what was it called? Uh, total Recall. You know, and that, the whole thing about was, was what they call terraforming Mars. In other words, releasing the oxygen that's stored in the water of Mars and forming um, atmospheric oxygen so humans could, so Arnold could survive, you know, some evil empire or whatever it was trying to kill. All his movies, he's, somebody's trying to kill him, almost all of them. And uh, anyway, so on Mars, he, he figured out how to terraform Mars. And also the pretty girl, he got the pretty girl as always in the movies. And, uh, but yeah, that, that's uh, subsurface water. There's plenty of CO2. And we can see that as well in the North and South polar ice caps. Um, curiosity is looking for other signs of life. Uh, for instance, methane. There's a famous um, Italian uh, scientific group that has observed methane plumes on a seasonal basis in middle latitudes of Mars. Very hard to see, very tough, but they, they spotted it. And their thought is that this methane in the atmosphere of Mars that they observed is from some kind of organic uh, life form on Mars. Extraordinary uh, proof if it really is kosher. And there's all kinds of debate about life on Mars. Is it still there? Was it ever there? Uh, and that's the other thing that we're trying to find out about Mars. Now, this may not seem uh, related to that, but volcanoes on Mars are important for life on Mars, just as they are here on our planet. Now, the biggest volcano in the solar system is, is, is actually on Mars. It's not a biggest planet uh, by any means, but it has the biggest volcano, Olympus Mons. There's a picture of it. And they've traced over the outline of Arizona over it, all right? And it's, it's similar, this Olympic Mons is right out there in the middle of nowhere, basically a big plain. Um, and it's like the Hawaiian Island volcano chain, all right? But it's much larger. You know, out there in the middle of the, of the Pacific, there's a hot spot in the Earth's mantle. And that hot spot forms volcanoes uh, in Hawaii and all those volcanoes and, and stuff in Hawaii and, and the mountains that are left over after the, after the volcano goes dormant, um, those are all formed in a similar way, we think. Now this one is, oops, this one's 26 kilometers tall and it would cover up the state of Arizona for the most part. You can see that, right? We have not seen it erupt but we think that this, you know, that I hope in your lifetime, you live to see um, an eruption of Olympic Mons because if we do, it's going to be very, very exciting. And if there's, if by that time there are men and women based on Mars, exploring Mars from a, a Mars base. Oh my goodness, they're going to be busy. Uh, because these, these uh, volcanoes put out, you know, like on Earth, volcanoes put out huge amounts of water vapor, huge amounts of CO2, uh, sulfur dioxide, methane, all kinds of gases come out with all the molten lava. You know, the molten lava's got a lot of, it's just like soda pop. You know, when you, when you have a bottle of soda pop, it just looks like liquid. But when you unscrew, if you shake it up and then unscrew the cap, all the gases that are dissolved in the soda pop, you know, they fizz out, you know, it, it blows out. The same thing with lava. You know, it's got a lot of gases in it. And when it's depressurized, when the volcano blows, you know, you get all those gases come blazing out. And that's actually what kills a lot of people. You know, like when Mount Vesuvius blows and stuff like that. When this thing blows, oh my goodness. It's a good thing we're not on the same planet. All right, here's a picture of Arizona and superimposed on it. Here's the Hawaiian Islands. So our, 
Um, our biggest volcano on Earth is Hawaii. And it's a little bit smaller than Olympic, Olympus Mons on, on Mars. Now, let me ask you a couple clicker questions. Um, get your clickers out. Option D, D. By the way, I, I, uh, if you got an odd number of points, uh, one point or three points for your clicking, um, only a few of you did, but if you did, you got partial credit on your clicking. I gave partial, this one, it wasn't designed to have a whole lot of partial credit, but uh, uh, anyways. Uh, so uh, clicker question number one, volcanoes on earth pour out lots of molten lava. What's the other name for it? And hopefully you know the answer to this. Burnett's magma hypertrophic granite eustachian vermite. Option D is looking pretty good there. C. All right, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, ching. Um, I really couldn't trick anybody with those other ones. I made those other three up. <laughs> uh, and here's another question. In addition to magma, a volcano can also emit great volumes of Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Did you just select this one as the correct answer? Mm -hmm. You can do that. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is the correct answer. Most of you got it. Okay, um, let's talk about the atmosphere of Mars. 96% carbon dioxide. By the way, that image is NWA 7034, pretty important piece of rock because it's from Mars. It's a meteorite, a little fragment of Mars that actually got blown off when a big asteroid hit Mars. This little fragment went flying out into space and eventually landed in Northwest Africa, NWA. 3% uh, nitrogen, trace amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, oxygen is mostly gone. Uh, nitrogen is almost gone. Carbon di the reason carbon dioxide is still present is because it is um, heavier. Nitrogen is a little bit heavier than oxygen, uh, but the nitrogen is almost gone as well. We know that liquid water was abundant in the past. We don't see many signs of it. We see uh, erosion features like a huge canyon formed by water called Valles Marineris. Uh, discovered by the Mariner uh, spacecraft. Um, we occasionally see uh, melt water. We think it's water melting um, suddenly and, and cascading down the side of canyons if we catch it before it gets covered up by a dust storm. Um, so we've also found rocks uh, that form in water. You know, certain rocks, that's, you know, the minerals. And you know, we figure out, we look, you know, the, the rovers have these devices that, that, you know, basically look at the spectra of the rocks that they're, they're faced with. And they analyze the spectra and figure out what kind of rock it is. And we know from Earth that that specific kind of rock 
only forms in water or submerged in water. Uh, so we know that rocks that form in water uh, are found on the surface, but it, you know, as with all the pictures, it looks like the middle of southeastern Montana, red rock everywhere, or Nevada, or Arizona, or any other, in the middle of Australia, the Gobi Desert. Um, there's a lot of H2O in the polar ice caps, uh, but we've got uh, other stuff in there like methane. Now, a couple other things I want to review with you, and that's the solar energy budget for Mars. For Earth, there's about 1,367 watts of solar power, not electrical, uh, per square meter. So if you went to the top of the atmosphere, above all the clouds, above all the aurora borealis, you know, in fact, up above where the space shuttle and the space station are, a little bit further out than that, every square meter catches about 1,367 watts of solar power from the sun. Now, on the night side of the Earth, of course, it doesn't catch any. So if it's facing the sun, it catches about that much. Now, on Mars, that same square meter up above the atmosphere of Mars only catches 591 watts per square meter for facing sunward. Okay, now what the planet does, what Mars does is same as Earth. Some parts of Earth reflect, like clouds. Clouds are white because they reflect sunlight. If you've ever been on an airplane ride and you look down on the clouds, a lot of times they're white or a shade of white, or a, you know, like almost grayish white. And they, that's because they're reflecting sunlight. The oceans will reflect sunlight, but they'll also absorb solar energy. And the oceans are the enormous reservoir of solar energy uh, on our planet. Global climate is controlled by the solar energy absorbed in the oceans. Uh, some of it is scattered, okay? For instance, our uh, atmosphere scatters different colors of light in different directions, and that's why our atmosphere looks blue. You know, the, the blue-white um, scatters differently than all the other colors of the rainbow. Okay, now, here's a little um, kind of a comparison of Earth. Now, to understand what this, go ahead and make a sketch of this. Okay, I've got Earth, and over here is Mars, this red circle, and Here's a disk facing the sun, the same size as Earth. And then over here, here's another one um, facing the sun and the same size as Mars. Now, Mars is smaller, okay? So make your sketch. Now, here's the sunlight coming into Earth. Okay, now we get about 1,367 watts from that. But for the stuff that bypasses Earth and keeps on going out to Mars, it's diluted to about 591 watts per square meter. So make a sketch of this, kind of a visual representation of that solar energy budget or what we call the solar constant. Uh, the solar constant for Earth is about 1,367 watts per square meter. For Mars, it's about 591 watts per square meter. So what, here's another way to think about that. You can make a note of this. The spacecraft up there on Mars have solar panels for electricity, all right? A square meter uh, of a perfectly efficient solar panel on Mars would only be catching 591 watts. So you can't run as much electronics off of that. To run the same electronics as you do on Earth, you'd have to have bigger panels because it's only 591 watts per square meter. So if you need 1,000 watts, you've got to have bigger panels on Mars than you do on Earth. All right, now here's a table. Uh, Mars versus Earth. Now, uh, just go ahead and make a note. Um, we'll, we'll start with this table on Thursday, uh, the Mars versus Earth table. And make a note of your reading assignment. Go ahead and skim 10, 11, and 13. And comets and isotopes will be the topic for Thursday. You're dismissed. And if you didn't get your exam printout, come on up. We'll try to get it right now.
Can you be in charge of that? And I'll get this. Okay, um, can I bring it on Thursday? Okay, let me try to get that done. Hold on to it for a second. It's all right.